We ended the last video with the March of the 10,000. Now, during that time, while the Persians were tied up with the 10,000, the Greek Ionian cities took that opportunity to rebel from Persia. Now, you will remember that after the Peloponnesian War, these Ionian Greek cities off the coast of Asia Minor had been under the control of Cyrus. And the Spartans really didn't have a problem with that. They loosely supported Cyrus controlling these cities because Cyrus had been such a good friend of the Spartans during the Peloponnesian War. But now that Cyrus was dead, the Spartans really didn't see any reason to let the Persians take control of those cities. But the Persians wanted these cities back. And so there was really a huge decision here looming for Sparta. And it had massive implications. And that was what to do with these Ionian Greek cities. Should they allow Persia to take them back after this revolt? Or should they support the revolt and come to the aid of these cities? And again, this was a huge decision because it had massive implications on Sparta's future. Now, Sparta could have easily have told these Ionian Greek cities that you're on your own, that we had a contract, we had an agreement with Persia, and we are going to honor that agreement. Well, it wasn't quite as simple as that because the circumstances had now changed. And whenever circumstances change, that can be a very dangerous thing. And the first thing I just noted was that Cyrus was now dead. But also, Sparta was now the uncontested master of Greece. And if they allowed the Persians to take back these cities, the Spartans would look like cowards because they didn't come to the defense of Greek cities against Persia. And pretty much the entire Greek world disliked the Persians. And so that would have looked very bad for Sparta. So certainly there was some hubris here on the line for Sparta. And how would that look for Sparta? How would that look for Sparta if they allowed these Greek cities to be retaken back by the Persians? Especially since the Spartans were now the sword bearer of the ancient Greek world. Well, it might look a little bit cowardly. And that was a very dangerous word to float around Sparta. So they certainly felt compelled, because these were Greeks after all, to come to their defense. Now, the other reason involved that issue with the March of the 10,000, and that had made the Persians look very weak in the eyes of the Greek world. And so certainly this must have given the Spartans a lot of motivation to launch another invasion of Persia. And so the decision was made by Sparta to disregard their latest ally, Persia, and to come to the defense of those Greek Ionian cities. And as we will see going forward in this video, it had massive implications in the history of Sparta. And so all of this occurred in 400 BC, again, right after the March of the 10,000. Now, the great king dispatched his favorite satrap, Tisiphern, to Asia Minor to reconquer these Greek Ionian cities. And yes, Tisiphern, will he ever go away. It seems like we're always talking about Tisiphern, doesn't it? Anyways, he's back again, and it was his job to reclaim all these cities that had previously belonged to Cyrus. And Tisiphern demanded without exception that all of these cities had to show absolute submission to the great king. And Tisiphern could do this because he was given additional authority by the great king. He was now in control of several other satraps, so he had a lot of power in Asia Minor. Now, as I mentioned before, the Ionian Greek cities rejected Tisiphern and appealed directly to Sparta. And as I mentioned, the Spartans decided to support this Ionian rebellion. And they dispatched a Spartan general named Thibron. And they provided him 4,000 Peloponnesians. Now, the key here is these were Peloponnesians, not Spartiates. Because the Spartiate population, like we've talked about in previous videos, was in serious decline. And so they could only dispatch Peloponnesians. And so that is the army that Thibron commanded. And Thibron himself went to the Athenians to try to acquire some cavalry. And interestingly enough, the Athenians, and I find this a little bit humorous, decided to provide Thibron some of the soldiers they didn't like. And so if they perished in Asia Minor, well, they wouldn't really care. They wouldn't really lose a lot of sleep over that. And these had been soldiers that had served under the 30. And as we know, the 30 were overthrown very quickly and were very unpopular in Athens. 
And so Thebron arrived off the coast of Asia Minor, but he didn't immediately confront Tisafern. Now apparently Thebron spent as much time attacking Ionian Greek cities as he did Persian cities, and that was not part of the original plan. Remember the Spartans were supposed to be liberating the Greek Ionian cities, not attacking them. And so Thebron became very unpopular for attacking his own allies. Thibron also concentrated on weaker cities that resisted his advances. Now, Thibron's first main target was the city of Larissa, and it seems his main tactic was to cut the city off from its main supply of water. And apparently he tried literally every strategy in the book. He even, according to Xenophon, built a wooden tortoise. I would have loved to have seen that, by the way. But apparently this attempt failed. And Sparta began to grow impatient with Thibron's lack of progress in Asia Minor. They expected major results and big victories, especially over Tisafern. And so they ordered Thibron to break off his siege at Larissa and to march against a town called Korea, which Sparta felt was the more important target. Now, just as Thibron was about to march on Korea, he was replaced by another Spartan general, Dersilidas. And so he arrived to take command of the Peloponnesian army. And so Thibron returned back to Sparta in disgrace, where he was appropriately fined and banished. Now, Dersilidas apparently decided to change tactics up a little bit. He decided to do the old tactic of divide and conquer. And he was aware of the disputes between Tisafern and Pharnabasis. You will remember during the Peloponnesian War, there was a great rivalry between these two great satraps. And so Dersilidas decided to exploit this rivalry. And so Dersilidas decided to make peace with Tisafern and concentrate on Pharnabasis. Now here we get an interesting side story from Xenophon, and I love side stories, and this is kind of an interesting backstory. Pharnabasis had a satrap under him by the name of Zenus, and Zenus was in control of a province called Aeolia, which you can see on the map right here. And this map on the right has yet a closer view of the province. At some point, Zenus fell sick and died, and Pharnabasis had an important decision to make who to appoint as the new satrap. Now, apparently, a woman named Mania, who was the wife of Zenus, approached Pharnabasis, and she appealed to Pharnabasis to take control of the territories that her husband had previously ruled. And Pharnabasis apparently listened to her appeal and remarkably decided to appoint her as satrap, and apparently she was an able administrator. And as a result, she was not only able to provide the necessary tribute to Pharnabasis, she was also able to lavish him with all kinds of gifts. And she became so important to Pharnabasis that she became one of his chief advisors. And Pharnabasis even took her on campaigns and consistently asked her for advice. Now, unfortunately, this nice little story has a very bad ending to it. Mania had an evil son-in-law named Mydeus. And Mydeus apparently was outraged that his mother-in-law had control over Persian provinces. And so he decided to strangle her. Mania's own son was also murdered. Now, Pharnabasis was outraged by this and decided to seek revenge for the murder of Mania. Now, Dersilidas arrived at the opportune time. He was able to take advantage of all the discord that was going on in Aeolia. And he convinced two cities right away to join his cause. And that was the city of Larissa, which Thibron had attempted to take by siege, and Colonai, which you can see on the map right here. Now, with a firm base of operations, he sent messages to other cities around Aeolia and asked them to become his allies. And so Xenophon tells us that Dersilides was able to take nine cities in eight days without doing a lot of fighting. He was able to convince them to switch sides through messengers. And so Dersilides, at least at this point, was able to avoid a major confrontation with the Persians. Now, Pharnabasis must have been in shock over all the losses in Aeolia. And so Dersilides decided to seize the moment and ask Pharnabasis if he wanted peace or war. And apparently Pharnabasis wanted nothing to do with the Greeks, and he chose peace. And that occurred in 399 BC. Now it's important to note that the Spartans really hadn't achieved a major victory over the Persians at this point. In other words, Tisafern and Pharnabasis still retained their armies. 
they had not been defeated in battle. And although Dursilidus had performed better than Thibron, he still had not inflicted a major defeat upon the Persians. Now, after Dursilides signed a peace treaty with Pharnabasis, he decided to garrison some of the cities in Aeolia and then move north into Thrace. Now, Dursilides was reappointed to his command for the next two years, and that occurred between 398 and 397 BC. Once again, Tisiphern and Pharnabasis seemed more intent on avoiding an open confrontation with the Peloponnesians despite having huge advantages in terms of numbers. So both sides opted to keep the truce in place, though there were a couple times the peace nearly fell apart. So really all Dersilidus had done was take over some of those possessions that we talked about in Aeolia. But for the most part, the Spartans had been unable to secure a major victory. And that caused a lot of tension in Sparta itself. Now, in the year 397 BC, Pharnabasis decided that the Spartan threat could only be eliminated by defeating the Spartan fleet. Now, I find that interesting that the Persians wanted to defeat the very Spartan fleet that they had helped fund during the Peloponnesian War. In any event, Pharnabasis took his idea to the Persian king himself, where his plan was well received. So basically the Persian strategy was defense by land and offense by sea. But there was a problem. The Persians needed an able commander to lead their naval forces. And here they ran into a bit of luck. They found Conan hanging out on the island of Cyprus. You will remember Conan was the Athenian admiral who had been involved in several of those battles in the Hellespont. Well, here he was in exile on Cyprus after the Peloponnesian War. By the way, Cyprus had remained in Persian control throughout the 5th century BC and had been one of the few Mediterranean islands to remain in Persian control, both before and after the Peloponnesian War. So the Persians offered Conan command and promised to build him a fleet of 300 ships, which would be his to lead. Conan eagerly accepted this because now he could exact revenge upon the Peloponnesians who he undoubtedly hated. But Conan also had some ulterior motives, as we will find out later on, because once the Spartan fleet was defeated, he planned on converting his fleet to an Athenian fleet. But we will talk more about that later on. By the way, all of these naval preparations by the Persians were done in absolute secret because the Persians were essentially trying to buy as much time as they could before starting a major confrontation with the Spartans. Now, in Sparta, the Spartans had heard rumors that the Persians were planning something big at sea. They had heard rumors of Persian ships being built and entering into harbors under the control of the Persians. The Spartans decided to call a war council of their allies to decide what should be done. Now, remember, technically there was still a truce with the Persians, although it was extremely shaky in every sense of the word. Now, at this meeting, Lysander convinced the Spartan king, Agesilaus, to start a new campaign in Asia Minor. And so now the Spartans weren't messing around. They were going to send their king, and now all of the other Spartan generals would now be under his command. Agesilaus, by the way, had just recently ascended to the throne. Now, you will remember a few videos ago, we talked about the two factions in Sparta. One faction wanted to remain in the Peloponnesus, while the other faction wanted to establish a Spartan empire. Agesilaus was not part of the conservative movement, and along with Lysander, he wanted to establish a Spartan empire. So this was very different from other Spartan kings, such as Pausanias, who were very, very conservative. So from this point on, Agesilaus will become the central figure in Sparta, and he will be very important for the next 25 years, leading right up to the Spartan defeat at Leuctra. So with this, Agesilaus went before the Spartan assembly and requested 30 Spartan officers, 2,000 helots, by the way, these were helots that had been given their freedom, and well, this was a bonus for Sparta because now they could put these helots in their army. And remember, the Spartans were really desperate to increase the size of their army. Another 4,000 allies were requested, which would bring the total size of this army to 6,000. The Spartan assembly readily agreed to all of Agesilaus' demands and even talked in six months of provisions. That was more than enough time for Agesilaus to establish a base of operations in Asia Minor. Now, the important point to make here is that Agesilaus wanted to not just attack Persia, but conquer all of it. 
He wanted the whole enchilada, something the previous Spartan commanders had failed to do up to this point. And so Agesilaus broke camp and marched to Asia Minor. Now, as he was marching through Boeotia, this very bizarre incident occurred that would have huge implications in terms of Sparta's future relationship with the Boeotians. Agesilaus wanted to make a sacrifice to the gods in Boeotia. Now, what happened here was that Agesilaus wanted to use his own seer to make the sacrifice, but that was looked at as an affront to the customs and laws of the Boeotians, because after all, this was in their territory. And so the Boeotians wanted their own seer to perform the sacrifice, but Agesilaus refused. And so the Boeotians decided to interrupt the sacrifice, which greatly angered the young Spartan king. And they not only interrupted the proceedings, they apparently tossed the victims off of the altar and completely broke up the ceremony. From that point on, Agesilaus never forgave the Boeotians and would always look to war first with the Boeotians rather than peace. By the way, in ancient times, I think the very last thing I would want to do is interrupt any sacrifice. The Greeks took sacrifices very, very seriously, especially the Spartans who were very, very religious. In any event, an enraged Agesilaus sailed away with his army to Ephesus in Asia Minor. Here he found Tisiphern anxious to determine what the Spartan king's motives were. Agesilaus stated that he was here to defend the independence of the Greek cities in Asia Minor. And so both sides, for at least the moment, agreed to keep the truce. Though this situation was more like a powder keg, a situation that seemed ready to explode at any moment. Now, there was a little sideshow going on here between Lysander and Agesilaus. Lysander, by the way, had accompanied Agesilaus to Asia Minor. At a party, Lysander was given so much attention and favor that Xenophon states that you might have thought Lysander was the king, when in reality, of course, he was not. A myth to Agesilaus decided to ignore Lysander and his friends. Now, at this point, Lysander decided it wise not to anger the Spartan king, who happened to also be a lifelong friend. And so he decided to tone down his adoring fan base. Lysander further requested to be sent on a mission, which Agesilaus approved and sent him off to the Hellespont. So, bye-bye, Lysander. Now, during this time, Tisiphern was building his forces in anticipation of a conflict with the Spartans. Now, Agesilaus didn't want to wait around for the Persians to overrun him, so he decided to march on Caria. Yep, that same city that Thibron was supposed to have captured long ago. Tisiphern began to transfer as many troops as he could to Caria to stop the Peloponnesian army dead in its tracks. Agesilaus, however, switched directions and marched towards Phrygia. This would move him into the territory controlled by Pharnabasis. And that probably didn't bother Tisiphern too much because he hated Pharnabasis. And you have to wonder if he was actually rooting for Pharnabasis to win the engagement against the Spartans. In any event, there was a brief engagement where the weak Hellenic cavalry was defeated by the much stronger Persian cavalry. But as always, the Peloponnesian infantry proved itself superior and saved the day against the Persians. Agesilaus, however, realized in order to achieve a decisive victory, he needed a more suitable cavalry. So he ordered all the surrounding areas under the control of the Spartans to provide as many horse and arms as they could, and he then retired to Ephesus for the winter. So at Ephesus, Agesilaus began to build up his army and equip his army as well. He also drilled his army constantly for the coming battles with the Persians. This time the prime target was Sardis, which had always been Persia's main stronghold in Asia Minor. And so Agesilaus and his reinvigorated army left Ephesus towards Sardis. Tisiphern dispatched troops this time to meet the Peloponnesian army, and the two sides met at the river Pactolus. The Peloponnesian army defeated Tisiphern, and according to Xenophon, took more than 70 talents, as well as a large amount of war booty, which also, by the way, included camels. The great king blamed Tisiphern for the defeats and had him beheaded at Sardis. Thus came an end to Tisiphern's quite long and somewhat mixed career as a Persian general and satrap. I will point out, though, that I don't think anyone would ever question his loyalty. After this episode, the Persians sought out Agesilaus and asked the Spartan king for peace. This peace offer was made by the new Persian satrap, Tithraustus. Now, Tithraustus replaced Tisiphern. So, Tithraustus pointed out that the Greek cities in Asia Minor had their autonomy, and therefore Sparta's goals had been achieved. But what were those goals? 
What were the Spartans' real intentions in Asia Minor? It seems quite clear that Agesilaus wanted to conquer all of Persia rather than just liberate the Greek Ionian cities. Though this is somewhat unclear because we never really get a good idea of the Spartans' true intentions from Xenophon. In any event, Tithraustus made his proposals for the Spartans to leave and then offered a backup plan if the Spartan king refused. And that was for Agesilaus to move into the territory of Pharnabasis. Wow, well that was a great idea because it would take the heat off Tithraustus while simultaneously making Pharnabasis look bad. My guess is Tithraustus probably feared for his life given what happened to Tisiphern. Now to sweeten the offer, Tithraustus even offered Agesilaus 30 talents to move out of his territory. So there was some nice bribery going on here as well. If you can't defeat them, pay them. The Spartans, however, balked at this, and this led the Persians to hatch a new plan. If they could not get the Peloponnesians out of Asia Minor, they decided to seize on the discord in Greece. The Persians offered gifts in the way of money and cash to several Greek city-states, including Boeotia. And the idea here is that these Greek city-states would start a rebellion. So it seems the Persians had two tricks up their sleeve. The first was to build that fleet we talked about and defeat the Spartans at sea, and the second was to cause trouble in the Greek mainland, so that this would pin down the Spartans in mainland Greece. In any event, all of this built-up anger against Sparta and Greece was about to explode, and this led to the beginning of the Corinthian War, and we will get to that in the next video.